So we're going to start out with an overview of Java 8 and the programming paradigms, or paradigms, if you want to mispronounce it. It's a malapropism. Uh, paradigms that it supports. So what you'll get after this discussion is a, a high-level understanding of the two key programming paradigms that Java 8 supports. Java 8's been out for about three years. It was released in March of 2014, so almost three and a half years. And one of the things it has is something called lambda expressions and method references. That's the functional programming features that it adds. Of course, it's long had all the object-oriented stuff we're going to summarize here very quickly. And then it also has some other really cool things like the streams API and completable futures. And that's what we're going to be focusing on once we get this quick overview of Java out of the way. Java 8 is a hybrid language like the Sphinx or a, a Griffin or whatever, right? It combines different things. And what it combines is essentially object-oriented programming, which is kind of what it swiped from C++, with functional programming, which it kind of borrowed from other languages that do functional stuff like Scala or ML or Haskell and so on. And so it, Java 8 kind of combines both. You can see that we have in, imperative and declarative paradigms. Those are the fancy names for these things. What's an imperative paradigm? So an imperative paradigm is one where a program consists of commands that it's instructing the computer to perform. So typically, imperative languages, which would be things like C or Fortran or C++ and so on, um, describe how the program operates via statements that explicitly change state. Right? You're assigning to a variable. You're reading the value of a variable. You're changing the state of the program. And you're saying, do this, do that. That's how you program. My guess is, unless you've been doing functional programming or using parts of JavaScript or whatnot, you've probably been doing imperative programming most of your lives. Here's a simple example of an imperative program. This is a, a little method called zap. And what it's doing is it's reading in a list of strings called lines. And you give it a string that you want to omit. And it's going to go and make a new array list. And then for every line in the list of lines, it's going to check to see whether or not that line equals the string we're trying to get rid of. <clears throat> and if it equals, then it skips it, right? It omits it. If it doesn't equal it, then it goes ahead and adds it to the result. And then when it's done, it returns the result. So that's an imperative program. It says, do this, do this. Here's a loop. Here's a data structure. Add something, remove something, et cetera. One thing to note. So this is about this programming style tells the computer how to do the computation. Notice something else interesting, and I'm just going to mention this obliquely now. We'll come back and go into this in much more detail later, because that's the whole point of the class. This way of programming is inherently sequential. And it uses what we sometimes call the, an accumulator pattern. Right? So we're accumulating the result into this list of strings. And if we want to make this thing run concurrently, we have a lot of work on our hands to make changes to make this thing run concurrently. It's not going to be something where you just make one little tweak and it suddenly runs on multiple cores. Most software in existence today works like this, or some variant of it. In contrast, there's declarative programming. And declarative programming doesn't say how to do it. It says what the computational logic should accomplish. And it doesn't describe explicit control flow or explicit algorithmic steps. So it's, it's a somewhat higher level of abstraction. It's about the why, not the how. So it's, or the what. So you're doing, say, what you want done, not how to do it. So here's the same program. Here's Zap written in a more declarative way using Java 8 streams. And if this makes no sense whatsoever at this point, that's fine. We're going to cover this all in great detail, mostly next week. So what we do here is we take in our list of strings, and we say, hey, I want this list of strings to be turned into something called a stream. And we'll talk about what a stream is. Just think of it as a flow of values. And then I want to filter out anything in this stream that does not match, or, or sorry, I want, to, I want to filter out anything that does not match this conditional expression. So if it's 
equal to the line we're trying to omit. We don't want that. We, don't, we filter that out. That's removed. But let other things pass that are not equal to that string, to the omit string. And after we do that, then I want to collect all the results that were not the omit string into a list, and that gets returned as the return value from the zap method. So this is a way of declaratively removing a string, which may occur multiple times, from a list of strings. And notice that this code does not say how. It says what, right? It says get rid of stuff that is uh, matching this string we want to omit. And notice something else interesting here. This is something that's called fluent style programming, where you cascade method calls where each method works off of the output of the method before it. So the method, a given method's input is the output of the method that preceded it. So it's kind of like a little pipeline. So that's what's called fluent style. The other thing to notice here is unlike the previous example that I showed you, the imperative version that used the accumulator pattern, it was hard to parallelize without a lot of surgery. This approach is absolutely, ridiculously easy to parallelize. We simply go from stream to parallel stream. And boom, this thing will magically run in parallel on multi-core machines. Now, whether that's a win or not is a whole other story. And we'll cover that in much detail later. For something really simple, like you know, five, <laughs> a, a list of five elements where you're checking to see if they're equal. That's probably not worth parallelizing. But for other things, it probably is worth parallelizing. I heard a great analogy the other day. They said, if you're, uh, you know, if you're at home with your family and you've got you know, maybe two parents and a brother or a sister, you know, like four or five of you, then when it's time to clean the table, it's probably best if um, you know, one person just takes all the, the plates and, put, uh, and uh, silverware and puts them in the, in the dishwasher or the sink. That's probably possible. If you are at a a wedding reception with 100 people or something like that, that approach doesn't scale, right? So you're probably better having a team of people go out and remove all the silverware and the dishes from the table. So bigger problems lend themselves to parallel solutions. Small problems don't. But the point is that irrespective of whether it's a win, it's really simple to make this kind of code parallel. And the other thing to note, by the way, here is that what's happening in filter is what's called a stateless lambda. And what that means is that there's nothing here that requires state. The only thing that happens is we're, we're checking to see whether a condition is satisfied. That'll be really important when we go a little later. All right, we'll come back. We'll cover that in much more detail. So don't worry if, if that went by and you're like, what the heck is that syntax? It looks really weird. Um, so we can, we can parallelize this with, with minuscule changes. And it's the wonderful you know, declarative model that lets us do that.